Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Daniel, and I'm very, very excited to present to you the first video in a long-awaited series on refuting gambits and other unsound openings. Um, now, as the title suggests, uh, this is a video series where I will be offering very practical repertoires, very practical lines against some of the nastiest, trickiest, hackiest gambits and other openings um, under the sun. Um, I'll be going through all of those gambits, all of those lines that you've always struggled against, and I'll be showing you exactly what to do against them, how to get good positions against them. And my emphasis will always be on showing lines that are not only objectively good, but also relatively easy to memorize and easy to understand. Now, before we delve into this first video, where I'll be taking a look at a gambit that has essentially taken the world by storm for the last several months, known as the Stafford Gambit, um, I wanna just uh, preface this with a couple of uh, notes. Now, first of all, a, you know this is by no means is this series a uh, an attempt to respond in a negative way or a diss at uh, amazing content creators such as international master Eric Rosen, who is actually a good friend of mine uh, and whom I admire greatly, uh, who've created awesome instructional videos on all sorts of gambits and tricky lines. Uh, I'm not trying to kind of one-up Eric or any other uh, content creators for that matter, uh, but but the sort of motivation behind my YouTube series is to help players of every level get better. And I think that one of the things that players need is sort of one spot that they go to uh, in order to learn, you know, practical lines against uh, tricky openings that give them grief. So, you know, I'm just trying to kind of help players out and I will link um, Eric's uh, channel in the description below he's he's amazing and you should definitely watch uh, a lot of his videos uh, so I just wanted to make that very very clear uh, before we jump in uh, now with that being said let's go straight in now the Stafford gambit uh, is a gambit for black that begins rather innocuously white goes e4 black goes e5 and black starts with knight f6 which is uh, called the Russian game or Petrov's uh, defense Petrov defense, which is named after Alexander Petrov, 19th century master uh, from Russia, who sort of de developed this. I even, I, I think he actually wrote a book on the Petrov. And after knight takes e5, now black's main move here is to go d6, knight f3, and knight takes e4. And the ironic thing about this, and you'll understand why it's ironic uh, shortly, is that the Petrov itself, this position is actually very, very peaceful. It's one of the most solid positional openings out there. Uh, and yet the Stafford Gambit is one of the trickiest openings out there. So instead of playing D6, um, instead of playing D6, and I'm actually looking at the year in which the Stafford Gambit was first played, in 1857, uh, Howard Staunton, who uh, was, and not Howard Stafford, Howard Staunton, I'm not actually sure. Oh, I see why it's called the Stafford Gambit. In 1950, uh, someone named Stafford actually played it, but that wasn't the first person to play it. Howard Staunton, one of the strongest players in the 19th century, sometimes even called the unofficial world champion, uh, essayed this line for the first time. I was going to say Stafford was the first person to win in this line, but that's also not true. In 1905, um, a gentleman named Jonas uh, won with the Stafford Gambit. I guess Stafford uh, maybe wrote some sort of trees. I'll look this up after after I create the video. Anyways, we're dealing with uh, the Stafford Gambit, not um, writing a biography of uh, Mr. Stafford or, or Matthew Stafford. I was going to wear a Matthew Stafford jersey before making this video. Well, you guys know how lazy I am. In any case, Black sacrifices a pawn. He doesn't recapture. And this move, Knight C6, appears to be plainly absurd at first glance because not only is black not even trying to recapture the pawn he's basically giving white the center he's doubling his pawns and it appears that when white supports the e4 pawn with d3 he's going to be a healthy pawn up and that's exactly why people like the stafford gambit and that's exactly what makes it so dangerous it appears to be uh you know total malarkey total hogwash and, and, and yet it's not now, in the classical Stafford, black takes, d takes c6. And the idea of this move is to open up uh, this bishop on c8. 
And this is where we can see that the Stafford Gambit actually is uh, positionally understandable. Black has a lead in development. Now, this may sound laughable, but it's not. A lead in development is never laughable, and it always contains a certain degree of danger. Um, in addition to this, Black's got very sort of free development for his pieces, for his bishops, and so White has to take this opening very, very seriously, as many uh, have already found out. Now, if Black plays B takes C6, which is not a move that you'll, you're likely to face, but, you know, what I'm going to try to do in this video series is actually be as thorough as possible. And I will have sort of a TLDR summary at the end, which uh, the timestamp of which I'll link in the description below. Uh, but I highly recommend uh, for serious players to look at the whole video. I'm, I'm not going to go for, you know, five minutes or six minutes. I'm going to go for as long as it takes to cover all the pertinent lines. And my emphasis is always on helping people who are serious and willing to invest time because I think that that is what it takes to, to become good and, and to learn these lines. So again, I'll, I'll try to be thorough. Uh, and at the same time, I'll try to be succinct in the sense that, you know, I, I won't show 30 move lines. I'll, I'll end when I think that it's pretty clear that we've done our job. So with that in mind, B takes C6, we simply develop our knight. I think the only way that black can try to make this work is by playing D5. Uh, Bishop b4 has been tried once, um, and, and against this move, white can just play e5. So, you know, I, I, I dug around here. I tried queen e7, and I think the simplest is just to play queen e2, reinforcing uh, the threat of taking the knight. If knight d5, white captures. And now, of course, white can't play d4 because the pawn is spin, but what white can do is go c3 and then go d4. He's a healthy pawn up, and he's actually threatening... Uh, to fork the pawn and the bishop with queen b5. So for that reason, after b takes c6, knight c3, black should try d5. And again, the simplest is to just drive a wedge into black's position, e5 and d4. Black is essentially lost here if he tries to undermine white center. We just go knight takes d5. There's nothing to worry about here. And um, the rest, uh, you know, I always encourage you to sort of dig around on your own, but this is completely lost. There's one funny line here. I tried knight b6. Now, white has to be careful. You don't want to take the knight because the queen is pinned. So you give a check on b5. Now there's a million things you could do. But the strongest move is actually to go bishop g5. I actually think this has a comical effect. Bishop b5, bishop g5. And after queen takes g5, we play knight takes c7. And knight takes a8. And we're just crushing it. Everything is falling. Of course, if knight a, then queen d7. Now, I know all of your games are going to end this way. <laughs> no, they're not. BC is exceedingly rare. Everybody's going to play DC. Now we play D3. And one of the appeals of the Stafford is contained in Black's next move. So Black plays Bishop C5. That's the only serious move. Bishop D6 is the other move that has been tried. It does absolutely nothing. We are simply a central pawn up. Bishop E2, H5 is... We'll see that h5 is a very common move in the Stafford, but combining it with bishop d6 makes no sense because after bishop g5, white is out of the woods. He can castle, he can develop his knight, he's in good shape. So bishop c5 is the move. Now, I think for most people, the appeal of the Stafford is contained in this move, bishop g5, which to the untrained eye seems relatively reasonable. And in fact, uh, a quick search reels that five people have fallen for this over the board including one person in May of this year, 1900. So again, this is not to be sneezed at. And, you know, if you're doing this to train, I would encourage you, Agen Mater style here, to pause the video. Uh, and if you're simply uh, along for the ride, uh, the move here is uh, knight captures e4, uh, bishop captures d8, uh, bishop captures f2, and we have a legals made here on the board. Uh, so this is a form of legals made, actually, that is delivered by black and... Uh, after 94, white has to backpedal. And I didn't actually analyze this, but I think bishop f2 actually wins the queen. Black doesn't even have to recapture on g5, but we're not going to look at this for too long. There are a lot of traps in the Stafford. If you want to look at all of them, again, Eric Rosen does an amazing job laying out the majority of the tricks available to black if white is not extremely well prepared. Well, after watching this video, you will be. Now, the move that I suggest in this in this position is, is bishop e2. Uh, the motivation behind it is very simple. You're developing your bishop. 
you are potentially preparing to castle, although I say the word potentially with an emphasis because it's going to be very important to play this properly to delay castling. Uh, and you're also covering the g4 square. So you're stopping or taking the sting rather out of the move knight to g4. Now, of course, this move has been analyzed by Staffordites and, and their recommendation, which is going to be the move we sort of spend the majority of our time on, is in very much in the spirit of the Stafford h5. There are a handful of other moves that have been tried. Most of them are not serious. Let's quickly run through the alternatives. If Black Castles, well, that's completely contrary to the spirit of the Stafford. We castle and we can play Bishop g5. And again, in these types of positions, you're a pawn up. You can do anything you want. You can bring the knight around to f3. You can put it on c3. You know, this is well outside the scope of, of, of this video. Black no longer has any play. He's in big trouble. So instead of castling, Black can also try bishop e6. That's sort of the same thing. Black can't just develop his pieces uh, because here we're going to go c3. And once we look at the main line, this move c3 is going to acquire uh, a particular kind of meaning. So you'll understand why this move is played. And then we develop the knight to d2 and bring, around, bring it around to f3. And then we're ready to castle. So again, this is not serious. If he plays queen d6, that walks right into c3 because now... If he castles, we can play d4 and e5, winning the knight. So, I mean, this is all just ridiculous, but I wanted to make sure we're covering this just in case. The only serious alternative to h5 is the immediate knight g4, followed by queen h4. This is something I can see some players doing. It's been tried twice over the board. And here I recommend the move queen f3. I think that's not the only move. We can castle, but I think this is the most practical because... Someone who plays the Stafford is definitely not going to want to get an end game a pawn down. He's going to want a combative position. And so I've chosen lines specifically tailored to taking the sting out of the Stafford that way. So with that in mind, queen takes g4 is absurd. We just take the queen. We go bishop e3. We go knight c3. And we are up a pawn for no compensation. Um, just to point out, I analyzed this a little bit further. I looked at this line. And now I think a very good idea is to play the move h4 just to stop black from expanding on the king side of the g5. So a little finesse there, but you can play this in many different ways and, and white, is, white is in great shape. So for that reason, bishop takes g4 is to be expected. And now we go queen g3, threatening the queen trade. Black probably will decline. We go h3, chasing the bishop away. Two possibilities here. If the bishop drops back, we snag a pawn, and now we play the most annoying move of all time. We play queen g5, and black's like, ah! Yeah, you can just see the reaction of the Staffordites facing this move. And we're attacking the queen, attacking the bishop. And I, by the way, am, I have played the Stafford myself. So, you know, I, I respect this opening. Please don't get the wrong impression from this. I'm just having some fun. And the point is actually, if black goes rook g8, it may appear that black is going to recover the g2 pawn. But to the rescue comes bishop f6, trapping the rook in the corner. And the game is over. So for that reason... Just to repeat this, after knight g4 takes, queen h4, we defend against mate, takes, queen g3, threatening the queen trade, chasing the bishop away. Black has the move bishop d1, which is very much in the spirit of the line, but it doesn't do much. We go knight c3, and uh, if black takes on c2, uh, well, here we can just go king d2, trapping, uh, and let me just verify this trapping the uh, bishop. you got to verify everything. Yeah, that's the correct move. Um, and uh, the game is simply over here. The bishop can sacrifice itself. We play king d3. And I know some people might be saying, oh, I don't want to get the king to d3. Well, you know what? This is nothing. I mean, castles king c2. We'll see another line like this. Absolutely nothing. White consolidates. So for that reason, bishop b4 is to be expected. Now we get our bishop out to d2. Uh, bishop takes c3, um, and after rook takes d1, white is finally out of the woods, and black is in huge trouble. I analyzed it, the line a little bit further. Bishop b5, queen g4. Uh, we trade queens, and the funny thing is, after rook b1, bishop d4, you don't want to take on b7, because black's going to go bishop b6, and the rook's going to be trapped. But after c3 and king e2... White is completely winning despite the material equality, which is interesting because if you think about it carefully and we go g5 followed by rook h4, we're going to double on the h file. I mean, look at white's pawns. White's pawns are just going to run through black's position. 
First of all, I mean, not to mention the fact that black can't defend h7. So if you plug this into a computer, it'll literally give an evaluation of plus four, or plus five. And well, that's not an exaggeration because white's completely winning here. So again, knight g4 is exceedingly rare, but as I mentioned, I want to be fully thorough. I want to cover every possibility. And so now you're armed against knight g4 uh, as well, which brings us to the main line h5. So h5 is the move that is most popular. It's recommended by everyone. And it is the move that you are by far likeliest uh, to face against someone who, who knows what he's doing. Now we play the move c3. And this is the main move that you have to remember. If you take one thing away from this video, it is to play c3 before you castle. Castle is very common and it gets white in huge trouble after either queen d6 or even worse, knight g4. And I'm not going to delve into the details here, but you can probably see and you can establish this on your own. Eric Rosen has also won many games like this. This is actually already almost devastating for white. Well, if you take with the bishop, you take this way. If you take with the pawn, there's a lot of mates like this here. So you can, again, you can analyze this on your own. Do not castle. Do not castle. And the most important piece of advice, do not castle. Go c3. The idea of c3 should be self-evident if you're kind of fully engaged. You should realize that you're kind of preparing potentially to play d4 and slice off the bishop's control over the f2 square. Now, you might be concerned that it weakens the d3 pawn, but black doesn't have any pawns left in the center to exploit that with, so um, that is not a problem. Now, this move has also been analyzed, and the move that you're most likely to face, the only sensible move is bishop b6. If black doesn't play bishop b6, the only other move I even analyzed was knight g4. And knight g4 is very simply met with d4, followed by h3, followed by bishop g5. So there's really nothing that black can do here other than to play bishop b6 against d4. d4 is a huge threat, but you don't even have to rush with it. Um, I suppose that bishop b6 is, is a remote possibility here. And again, d4 followed by bishop g5 is a very foolproof method. Let's say d4, bishop g5, and again, knight d2 to follow. The rest is uh, up to you, but white has gotten rid of all danger. He's winning here. It's, again, plus three, plus four, something absurd. So bishop b6, the idea is prophylaxis against d4. d4 is no longer possible. It drops a pawn, which is why we play the move knight to d2, um, supporting the pawn on, on, on e4 preemptively. Uh, and technically, I believe that knight d2, well, this is still not a novelty. This has happened actually once in 2016 in an over-the-board game. And in that game, black played the move knight g4, which I believe to be the main line. I think that this is the only move that poses any real, well, danger is the wrong word. White is winning at the end of the line. But this is the most important move to remember. Again, if black develops, this doesn't do anything. We go knight f3, bringing the knight to a good square, and now we always meet knight g4 with d4. I analyzed this further, queen d6, h3, and castles, I thought maybe black can try this. And here, one important thing to remember is we can go b4 to stop c5, and, and then we can go queen c2 and just sort of develop normally, and at some point we can take the knight. So one thing to remember is that I, I tried something like this, you know, what if black tries to attack? Well, at this point, we can already take the knight. And the thing is, once we've moved the queen from the first rank, we can get this knight around to f1 and consolidate. White is up a full piece for zero compensation. And I want to make a side note and mention that you're not going to always avoid your opponent giving you a check. I mean, sometimes you have to accept that, yes, your king is going to be on f2, but you're going to be up a full piece for no compensation. That's just a risk that you have to be willing to take if you play 1e4. So, you know, I'm not going to teach you to avoid everything at the price of, of, of losing the advantage. I mean, so this is very far-fetched, but just wanted to make sure we have that covered. Queen d6 is another try. It's sort of a Stafford-y sort of move. Here, actually, a very good idea is to play a4 preliminarily. Knight c4 comes to mind, but once the queen moves, black can actually take with the a pawn. He can get the a file for his rook, at least something. So that's why it's a very good idea to play a4 threatening to trap the bishop, basically forcing a6 or a5, 
Now we go knight c4, and ugh, he has to take with a c pawn. That's even worse. We don't even give him that. Now we castle. Look at this beautiful position. Bishop can come out to e3, f4, you name it. White is basically winning here. So knight g4 is the only serious attempt. Now, why did we play c3? We didn't play c3 just to, you know, screw around. We played it to play d4, which is what we do here. There's a couple of concrete lines here. The game that I mentioned continued queen h4. That is the most tempting move. If black tries to undermine white center with c5, we almost always meet this move with knight c4. And after cd, we eliminate the bishop and our center is fully intact. If he tries queen h4 now, again, this is all just one move threats, which we easily defend against. And white is completely winning. We're going to chase the knight away, go bishop e3. No, we're not going to go bishop f3. We're going to go bishop e3 and we're going to be winning. If he goes queen f6, again, castles, queen h4, all this is nothing. We can go knight f3, we can go h3, it literally doesn't matter. Remember that if he goes queen f6 and then c5, we go knight c4. That is an automatic reaction, and we will review these ideas at the end. For that reason, queen h4, to provoke g3, makes the most sense. Queen h3 meets with a very tragic fate, bishop f1. <laughs> Uh, you didn't need me to tell you this. Queen f6 is the game. Actually, queen e7 was the game continuation. And this is maybe the only line that I would suggest you memorize, where it's a good idea to go a4 for the same reason we did it previously. And now you can go knight c4. So this is not an intuitive move. Um, and the reason it's not intuitive is because it seems to blunder um, a pawn, but it doesn't take long to establish. We just go f3. And black can try queen d5 to keep the contact with the rook, otherwise he loses the knight. But now we take the bishop and go c4. You can find all of this over the board. It's not that hard. But I would still suggest that you review this line three or four times. Just go back in the video, replay this line. Um, of course, why wouldn't people just watch this video 15 times? It's an amazing video. So I didn't need me, any, <laughs> me to tell you they were going to do that anyway. So for that reason, queen f6 makes the most sense. And... As per usual, we go knight f3. Um, white is completely winning here. The move that I tried is h4. This doesn't do anything. We just take it. And if the rook takes, we have bishop g5 winning the rook. I tried queen e7 here. And I concluded the line by saying h3. If knight f6, you can go e5. And you can basically do anything you want here. Queen c2 would be probably a reasonable move. Rook g1. There's a million moves that lead to a completely winning position. Um, and completely winning is an overstatement, but let's just say basically objectively winning. And again, queen c2, solid move. Then you can develop your bishop. Castle long. White is not only up two pawns. Look at black's position. It is in ruins. Other than h4, I really don't see what black can do. Because if he just develops his bishop, now we can just go h3. Um, and... Um, well, this is just, uh, is just horrendous, horrendous for, for black. We don't even have to. Again, I would say h3 followed by queen c2. Don't rush with bishop g5. Then we can just play bishop e3 and, uh, and either c4, c5, or we can castle. There's just a million different ideas. Um, and again, I would encourage you to sort of dig around in these types of positions. If you really, really want to do a good job on this, you want to make sure that you know all the relevant ideas. If black castles, then we go bishop g5 winning the rook. So... That essentially is the entire Stafford Gambit. Now, I tried to be as comprehensive as possible. I am sure that I missed some sidelines here and there. But by and large, I hope that I covered all of the necessary ideas. Now, if you've come here and you don't have 25 minutes to burn, you want the TLDR version. Here we go. I am going to project on the screen now the main ideas of the Stafford for White that you can be reading as I walk through the main lines once again. Um... So let's go again from the start. The Stafford starts out as the Petrov, then black plays knight c6. Okay, we take the knight, we go d3. He goes bishop c5, we go bishop e2 to stop knight g4. If he goes knight g4 anyway, we take and bring the queen out, and then we basically force the queen trade. He's not going to do that. He's going to play h5. Now we don't castle. h5 wants us to castle. We go c3 in order to prepare d4. And in order to have that as a move we can play against uh, various other moves. If he goes knight g4, for example, boom, d4. The only move to stop d4 against everything else we play d4. Bishop b6 is the only move against which we don't play d4. Well, why don't we play d4? Blunders the pawn. How do we defend the pawn? Boom, knight d2. 
very logical. Knight g4 is by far the most logical. Otherwise, we play either knight f3, or if he brings his queen out to d6, that walks right into knight c4. But remember, and I made this point, don't play knight c4 immediately, although you can, of course. a4 first is a great idea, uh, as I indicated uh, on point three, and now knight c4 so that he doesn't take with the a pawn, just winning for white. After knight g4, again, Cutting, cutting him off with c4. We're never afraid of c5 because of knight c4. And if he goes queen h4, if he goes queen f6, all of this are one move threats. We defend against them accordingly. Here's that move knight f3 again. If h4, we take it. If he goes queen a7, trying to hit our pawn. Boom, 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 boom. And I mean, we send this to blow this to smithereens. Now, it's very important not to get too cocky. I am quite sure that black can find some sort of tricks and traps here, although I've tried to basically cover everything. But essentially, after queen h4, g3, and knight f3, g takes h4, my official line ends here with a very, very overwhelming advantage uh, for white. And as you can see, and let me just remove these arrows, and the, so just so you can see the position purely. Now you can see point one delay castling. Um, until we have played c3 and knight d2, since, until we've made all the preparations. Meet knight g4 with d4, eliminate black's bishop. You can read all the points yourselves. Don't be afraid to take a hanging knight on g4. White should not fear c5 due to knight c4. I think that hits on most of the points. And uh, again, you're welcome to do some of your own analysis. Um, I do not promise that I found the absolute best line everywhere. In fact, you don't need me to just plug all these moves into the computer. What I've tried to find are practical lines that are not always, strictly speaking, the top choice of the computer, although everything here is computer tested and approved. Um, I'm not trying to sell you off on something that's hacky. Uh, in response to this effort, everything here is computer tested. And I've tried to be, you know, very meticulous in my testing to make sure I've covered all potential ideas. Um, and essentially, that's that. You accept the pawn, you go d3, bishop e2, c3, and then crucially, you resist the urge to play h3 and you resist the urge to castle. You're not afraid of knight g4 because you always have d4 in response. If you remember that and you remember to delay to castle, guess what? Next time you play Matthew Stafford, he's going to throw an interception on first and 10, in the first play of the game. So fear not the Stafford. This was Naroditsky's Gambit Clinic Clinic. Well, I should say Anti-Gambit Clinic Part 1. Hope you've enjoyed the video, and I will see you in the next video where I will bust and offer a practical line against another dubious opening. Thank you very much, um, and see you in the next video.